Okay, well this morning we are going to be doing a part two. So we had 1 Corinthians chapter 15, part one, uh, two weeks ago, and then Mother's Day, and then now we're going to uh, reapproach uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to get part two. So did you notice the last time when I started to preach uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I kind of pulled a fast one because I actually put Matthew chapter 28 in there and I spent more time on Matthew chapter 28. Well, this morning we're going to be uh, more time in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but we needed both of those things to help us in our, in our understanding, I'm sure. So good morning, everybody. I hope that you are all here uh, for the sake of worshiping the Lord. I hope that you are all here this morning. Uh, hopefully you have already prepared your heart. You are prepared, you are anxious, you're ready, because then if I say something that is not that clever, you're still listening for the Holy Spirit and, and not for me, right? Uh, because I'm only so bright and that's amen. And uh, that shouldn't have had so hearty of an amen over there. But it's true, it's true. I can't hold it against him. It's, uh, we're two peas in one pod. You and me. <laughs> so anyhow, so uh, the, the point is, is that, you know, maybe uh, I am not going to give the most dynamic sermon this morning. Maybe I do. Whatever. It really isn't about me. I hope that you guys aren't coming here to listen to me. I hope that you guys are here to hear the Holy Spirit that is within you. In certain ways, I'm actually more like a... Um, uh, what do you call the lady that's not an OBGYN, but wife that helps you give midwife is the word I was looking for. So glad she's here this morning. I'm more like a midwife. It's not actually my job to like put a baby in you and then pull something out. It is my job actually to be here and assist you as the Holy Spirit brings forth what has already been placed in you. Okay, and I'm here uh, simply in that midwifery sort of position to be assistative. Now, hopefully some of the things that I say are going to be guiding and hopefully none of it's like, you know, wrong, although I'm not like incapable of being wrong. So I want you to listen discerningly, but I'm hoping that what you're listening for, what you're listening to is the word of God. You're listening for the Holy Spirit, for his guiding, for his leading. Because again, I'm only just so bright. I, I only, I have some serious limitations, but I come with a heart to worship the Lord Jesus. I come with a heart to join you and I together. I want this to be a unified attempt at reaching for what the word has for us, okay? There's not one definitive final reading that I'm going to give you. I'm here to simply worship the Lord in front of you through his text. And I am asking that you would join me. Now, again, hopefully you've already been prepared. This morning you've prayed. You not only curled your hair and crimped your eyelashes, Lee, but that you also, um, but that you also prayed and you got things in order interiorly and all that stuff. However, if you have or if you have not, uh, let's go before the Lord and let's continue that work. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you as those who are in desperate need of you. This world is a crazy world, full of rottenness. And Lord, we look out and we see, and we've, uh, we've watched the news, and we've had the experiences on the, on the road as the driver shook their fist at us for driving either too fast or too slow or whatever. Lord, we've had the experiences at the grocery stores where we hear the complaining and the griping, and then we discover that actually all of these things are found in us, that we too have rottenness, we too have griping and complaining, we too shake our fist. Lord, we come simply as yours. We are not perfected yet. We come as, as yours, those that you've purchased for yourself. We are not in a place where we are holier than anyone, where we are better than anyone. Lord, we depend on you. And we call on you and we ask you to help us. Holy Spirit, we need understanding in order to love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. We need you. So please guide our reading, guide our hearing, 
guide our appreciation, guide our lives so that they will be lives of worship. We pray that you would make an impact this morning through your word and even through me. Use me as your bullhorn. We thank you for what it is that you have for us this morning. And we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, having said all of that, I do believe I have a word for you this morning. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, I'm going to do a little bit of reading. We read, we read over the entire chapter before, so I'm just going to refresh certain points here as we go back into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The first five verses we're, we're going to read. Whoa, that got really loud. I was suddenly spirit-filled. Okay. <laughs> We have issues. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay. So now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared i'm going to stop there and move forward lists some appearances for us go to verse 12 now and he says now if christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So resurrection is truly the point of this chapter. As Paul goes at length to explain and describe and delineate and uh, give illustration of the resurrection. Move forward into verse 17. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Verse uh, 20 and following as well. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God, to the God and Father when he... Sorry, I'll do it in English. Verse 24 again. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the, God and, uh, to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power for he must reign until he put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says, all things are put in subjection. It is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. Okay, hold there. First comment, I really should be wearing glasses. I just refuse. So it, uh, it doesn't help, but still. Okay, we're going to uh, pick up there. Christ has been raised. Now I'm just going to take it that uh, you recognize that and that you even appreciate that. And I'm going to move forward with the recognition that Christ has been raised from the dead. If that is a sticking point for you, if someone here has factual doubt as to whether Jesus rose from the dead, please come see me. This is something that I've processed at length. And for me to stand up here and recite the various proofs of the resurrection of Jesus is fascinating to me but may not be fascinating to some of the uh, other people here who are less uh, driven by like Christian apologetics and that sort of thing. But if you have factual doubt, please come see me. That uh, can be met, okay? But Jesus has been raised. 
the, the point of that is not to say what, like, that is a really neat trick that Jesus did. Like, he's able to do crazy things, like feed the 5,000 with, you know, just two fish and five loaves. That's pretty neat. Uh, he can um, have a, a paralyzed guy uh, get up from his mat. Well, that's pretty neat. And he can rise from the dead. Pretty neat again, like maybe even the most neat. Okay, it's more than that. There is a point about this. And I asked you guys, uh, not last time, but last time around on this uh, chapter, what is, what is the point uh, of this? Where does this meet us? Do you guys remember? And I was asking, what does it mean if Christ is in fact raised? What does that mean? And we went through and we asked some, some people. And uh, be prepared, because I might call on you again, right? I want you guys to be engaged with us uh, as, we, as we walk through this. But the one thing that it absolutely, definitely, for sure means is that Jesus is in fact that king. There has been the promise, the prophecy that there would be a Jewish king, a Messiah, the Christ, who would come, and that he would be God's man. This is evidence that that, it, that's what Paul says, that's where Paul is going with this, that Jesus is that king. And that is hugely important for so many reasons probably most of which uh, get past us because our thoughts of kings are uh, thoughts like, well, King George actually needed to be rebelled against and, you know, we went to war with Great Britain over that whole deal and kings are to be, you know, put aside and we haven't really seen a king as such for a really long time and we kind of have these King Arthur stories in our heads maybe. Well, we don't really know what a king is in the first place and Certainly that ultimate king, well, this is where the Old Testament is certainly uh, very uh, instructive and informative for us. But Christ has been raised. This means that he is that king, the one who is going to ultimately defeat the enemy, the one who is going to give to us peace, the one who is going to give to us the answer to the longing of hope. Jesus is that king. It also means that he has begun to reign, that there can be no question. He has been inaugurated. Now, specifically, the, the resurrection is being called on, but we're, we're going to have the ascension coming up soon. And the ascension is when Jesus is taken into the heavenly realm and he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he rules and he reigns. He is in heaven. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to him. Uh, th at that point, we have some very definitive statements about the authority that Jesus has, the power that Jesus has, the position that Jesus has. And we have one of ours. We have a human being, a human being. I recognize that Jesus is divine. I fully embrace the divinity of Jesus. I worship him as God. He is also human, and we cannot let that sneak past us. The human Jesus is on the throne of heaven. Now, we're going to talk more about that in the future as we get closer to ascension on the calendar, uh, but that, that point needs to be driven home. He's that king. He has begun to reign. Uh, he officially has been approved of by the Father. He has been raised up. So the world rejected him. We have the court of the Jews that condemned him. We have the court of the Romans that condemned him. So both in the religious world and also in the secular world where realize that uh, you know, the, the Romans, they had uh, justitia. Uh, you know the statue of the la lady who has the scales, the libra. Uh, she's known by a couple of different names. But justitia, that's where we get the name justice from. They had as one of their... Um, like panoply of gods, justitia, justice, mm -hmm, right? Holding up the scales. Justice was not met, but Jesus was condemned by Rome, who held justitia high. They held justice high. They were the ones who, and we here in America, we probably need to learn a little something from Rome because our, our courts and our legal system has turned into a system of laws. And I think justice has been utterly abandoned, in fact. I think that justice is being uh, jettisoned, shelled, so that we can have laws and so that we can have a system of 
did you breach this law or did you not breach this law? And that's another topic for another time. But I want you to see that justice is uh, being um, put aside. How does Jesus meet justice being shelled? Jesus meets justice by being condemned. Jesus meets justice being uh, uh, passed by, you know, waved aside. Jesus meets it by dying on the cross. Who's actually condemned? Those that would hold that high court and condemn Jesus? Or those that Jesus allowed? Go ahead. Have your full vent of power. See where that gets you. And as it turns out, Rome and, for that matter, the Jews have come under the condemnation of true justice. Jesus, who is the perfect human being, who had no sin, who went wrong nowhere, God, in the higher court, the supreme court, he reverses the decision of the lower court. Do you see that? The Jews said, condemn him, he's worthy of death, crucify him. Okay, let's move him up to the next higher court, the superior court. And he goes to the Romans. And the Romans say, well, we don't really find any wrong in him, but we make the rules. And since he's the king of the Jews, uh, let's go ahead and kill him in order to keep you happy. Because that's what really justice has to be is we'll keep the crowds happy. There won't be a riot. We'll stay in power because that's what justice is. I get to stay in power. And then not really. You guys see that that's not right, right? And so we'll condemn him to death. Superior court says, all right, fine, condemn him to death. And they put him in. Uh, so the analogy would be like if we put a prisoner into a prison, but that the prison couldn't hold him because the Supreme Court says, no, we reverse the decision, let him out of the prison. In this case, he was killed. And there should be no way of reversing that decision at all. You kill somebody, that's final, right? But the high court, God's court, says, no, 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 you will not condemn my son. No, 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 you will let him free from the prison. And Jesus rises from the dead. The law, the uh, justice system, the religious systems, the power systems, the power brokers, you all did your worst to him. And God says, no, 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 no. We're going to reverse that. So here's, here's a takeaway from that one right there, okay? If you're one of Jesus' people, it is quite possible that you're going to get on the business end of either being judged in a religious system, and the religious system is going to look down at you, or they're going to hold their nose up, or whatever. You, you may bump into a religious system that condemns you, that, that holds you at arm's length, that puts you to the margin. Well... That, that uh, uh, decision isn't final. It is God's judgment that is ultimate. It's God's judgment that is final, all right? So hold on to that one. That justice comes through Jesus, so we can tether that to this. Secondly, you may, even as a Christian, find yourself in some sort of a, a legal system that doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't work. It's broken. And somehow or another, you find yourself in condemnation. There have been plenty of people who have been innocent that have gone to prison. There have been plenty of people who have been innocent that have been condemned. You may find yourself at some point in time. I'll uh, just give you a quick illustration. This is so silly, but still. Uh, I was in my truck. I was driving along. I get to a stop sign. I look and I see a police officer. And I'm like, oh, police officer over there. Self-preservation alone said come to a complete stop. I go, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. Okay, I can go. And I started to go again, and I pulled off. I was actually going to church. The police officer pulls into the church parking lot and flips on his lights. I'm like, what in the world is this about? Because I've done lots of things wrong, and I haven't gotten pulled over. Now I'm bright, and now I'm getting pulled over. So I get pulled over in the church parking lot. Police officer starts talking to me and just starts firing off several things. Uh, come to find out... I had my license revoked. I didn't know that. There was a lady that had run into me in an automobile accident. She ran into my truck. I didn't fill out a piece of paper. I didn't fill out a piece of paper. So because of that, my license had been revoked. I'm driving on a revoked license. Officer says, well, we need to tow your truck now. And for the next month, I had to like, I, my license was revoked. Why? She ran into me. But you didn't fill out a piece of paper. This is what you, you didn't fill out a piece of paper is what you didn't do. 
okay, that's not justice. I had my truck taken away. Man, my job was so close to like firing me. There was lots of other crazy things that came out of that. But you can see, that's not fair. That's not justice. What's that got to do with anything? Such a minor, trivial little example. Cost me hundreds of dollars, terrible inconvenience. There was no justice in it, though, none. Like even if I did forget to fill out a piece of paper. Here's your piece of paper. Would you fill that out, please? Thank you so much. There we go, moving on. Like, no, that wasn't even available. So justice, even if we find ourselves condemned in that ultimate sense, maybe even to unto death, Let's just pretend for a second that this government, and I, I know, red, white, and blue, and God bless America, and right, I get it, okay? But let's just pretend like America falls under some heavy darkness, and someday in the not too distant future, somebody gets into power, and they decide that Christianity is actually in the way. Because these are the people that are resisting letting us do all the things that we wanna do. These Christians keep saying no. These Christians keep saying, bad. These Christians keep stepping up and saying accountability and so forth. And so then they decide, you know what the final solution is, is we need to get rid of the Christians because then we can do whatever we want to and nobody will get after us. Okay, we vote that if anybody prays or talks to invisible people, they're nutty. Okay? And so if you talk to invisible people, you're nutty and therefore not just prison, because after all, prison is like you've done something wrong and you need to be corrected. No, you're ill. And since you're ill, you need to be cured. Let's start medicating people who believe in God, and let's start putting people into asylums that believe in God, and let's just get them out of the way because we all know they're nutty. They talk to invisible people. Okay, let's do that. You think that's going to look like justice? It's not going to look like justice, but it'll happen. It, I don't know. I'm not making a, I'm not a prophet. That's not what I'm trying to say. But that sort of thing, it's not just altogether imaginary. That sort of thing could happen and has happened to other nations before. What happens then? Well, God's clearly forgotten about us, right? God's clearly lost, right? Hasn't he? No, 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 no. Just like Jesus, Jesus had to go through. See, when we talk about being saved, we're not talking about being spared from hardships. We're talking about being saved from the hardships. When we talk about being saved, we're not talking about being spared from death. We're talking about being saved from death. Jesus went all the way through treachery. He went all the way through rejection. He went all the way through being rejected by his own people. He went all the way through being crucified unto death, all the way through. But death could not hold him and death cannot hold those that belong to him. Death, the final enemy, is defeated. Death, the final enemy, will be overturned in the, final in the final day. The Jews were, at the time, awaiting God's kingdom. And as such, Jesus is the king, but they didn't see him being the king the way that they wanted him to be king. Now, before we look down our nose at them, has God ever disappointed you? Ask the disciples. He died. He died. Our king died. We thought he was the king. We thought he was the one. But now he's dead. And then he rises from the dead. And they weren't just like, well, yay, Jesus is rising. They were completely confused because they thought that Jesus had failed. They thought that death won. They thought that God was, that they were false uh, in their beliefs. They thought that they had spoken falsely. They thought everything was wrong. And then in the final analysis, it was brought to their attention and all of the confusion was given light, okay? So have you ever been disenchanted with something that God did? Because you did tell him, right? You prayed and you said, Lord, what you've got to do is this. What you've got to do is that. And then he didn't do it. Anybody ever experienced it? You guys are all looking at me like, I'm the only one? Okay, right, okay. So in the final analysis, though, there will be light put on, and we will see, and we will understand, and we will know. I want you to know that. And all of that is available to us because of the resurrection. More of that anon. But I want you to know that there will be light. There will be understanding. There will be clarity. We will know because of the resurrection. Like I said, more of that anon. The dead are going to be raised. I think that you all know that. I'm, I'm going to actually move ahead with a couple of other points that I really uh, want to 
get to that I think are uh, really important. God's going to put things in order. He's going to put things in a sequential order, and he's going to put things, he's going to arrange things in such a way that they are in proper working order as well. I think you guys know that. Let's um, go now to, yeah, I'm going to, sorry, I've got way more information than uh, time will allow. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward a little bit. All right, so let's go to verse uh, 20. Nine. Okay. Otherwise, this is, this is when Jesus rises from the dead. Everybody rises from the dead. The world is put in order. All things are put in subjection to him. Jesus hands the kingdom in its fullness over to God the Father. And then um, Paul starts remarking on that. And at verse 29, he says, Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? We are, uh, why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If Christ has not been raised then cowardice would actually make sense. Run away. This is all you've got. This is it. Make sure you don't get nabbed. Make sure you don't get caught. Go ahead and roll over on your friends if necessary, because after all, you've got to survive, right? No, no, no. If Jesus is raised from the dead, it gives you reason to be courageous. It gives you reason to be brave. It gives you reason even to die even to die for others. What do you get out of that if you simply just die and are dead? We are most to be pitied. In fact, what Paul seems to be saying is the uh, old equivalent of get the girls in the cocaine right now, because who cares? Just why not? Why not? Because if this is all that there is, if this is all that we've got, then just so what? So what? Burn it up. It's better to burn out than it is to just fade away, right? I, I'm going to say that's all wrong. That is that is entirely wrong. But Paul even ex uh, accepts that like, look, if Jesus isn't truly raised from the dead, do whatever you wanna do. It just doesn't even matter anymore. Who cares? Morality, chuck it out the window. If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, dog eat dog world, you get the best that you can get, okay? If Jesus is raised from the dead though, there's a huge difference that that is going to wind up making. You can be brave, it is for a purpose. So become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, for some, of, some have knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. Move down with me then to verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, and it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So Adam uh, received life and Jesus gave life. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And then he uh, says, I tell you a mystery that we will all, not all uh, sleep, but we will all be changed. Over and over and over, he refers to death as simply being asleep. It's simply asleep. The person is going to rise. They're gonna wake up. They're going to rise up. In a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable, verse 53, must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and the mortal will have put on immortality, 
Then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? All right, hold for just a second. Victory. Unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of appreciation or understanding of what victory is. The closest thing that we really get anymore that everybody kind of understands is in the sports world. Victory is our team won and your team did not win, also known as losing. You guys didn't get it, we did get it, right? That sort of thing. And so I'm going to borrow from that. And I actually know a guy, he's a hockey coach and he's also a theologian. But uh, this hockey coach gave me one of the best ways of appreciating this. When we read this, where it says, death is swallowed up in victory, oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? It's not Shakespearean. It's not, oh death, where is your, oh death, where is your sting? Ah, it's, it, that's not it. This is not pansy talk right here. This is, um, if you think more about, um, in sports, uh, they, they talk smack. Anybody here know what talking smack is? It's when you are getting in the other team's face and you really kind of give it to them. This is how it goes. Hey, Satan, did you see the score? You lose, punk. You lose. I know you can still hurt me. I get it. Look at the score. You lost. You lost. You don't have it. Jesus won. You're a loser. Punk. Step up. What do you got? You came up with nothing. I've got a friend that's looking down the barrel of a, uh, a cancer diagnosis. And it's, it's terminal. It's inoperable. It's, uh, you know, it, he's, he's not long for this world. Hey, death, where's your sting? You've got nothing. You've been defeated. Look at the score, man. You've been punked. Satan. Take that. What are you going to do? I know you can still hurt me. So what? You lost. You lost. Take it. Jesus wins. We rise. We live forever in peace and in joy. Satan, take that. You have been punked. You've been destroyed, defeated. Sit down. Just sit down. You've been beat. And we can talk that smack because it is Jesus who has won that victory for us. We can be bold about it. Talk bad to Satan. Talk him down. I don't mean to say he has no power. I don't mean to say that we need to be casual about it. I mean to say the power in Christ Jesus and the victory that we have been given is ultimate. It is definite. It is final. Death does not win. We do. We will all. If death does claim us, okay, man. Okay, I know, you can hurt me, I get it. But I'm going to rise because Jesus has made a place for me. Not because I've earned it, not because I've deserved it, but because I'm on the same team as Jesus. Jesus won the victory, I belong to him, you can't really even touch me. Look at the score, we win. Look at the score, we win, we win. Death, the enemy, sin, anxiety, all of that, defeated foe, defeated enemy. All right, so then if we take one step back, and this is where I'm going to close, if we see those things that Paul had said, and he's completely straightforward about it, if Christ is not raised, then you're still in your sin. If Christ is not raised, your faith is worthless. If Christ is not raised, then those who have gone before us are simply dead. That's it. But Christ is raised. So what does our victory look like? What does our victory look like? It means this. Preaching is good. Our word is not empty. Our word is not vain. Share the word. It's one of the best ways of sharing in the victory. Share the word. You, pew sitters, get up out of the pew and go talk about it. Let it be known. We win. Let it be known. Our preaching is good. My witness, powerful. My witness, good. My testimony, good. Powerful, okay? My faith, real. My faith is grounded in reality. My sins are forgiven. The, our loved ones who have sinned, 
their sins are forgiven. Our loved ones who have died in Christ, hold on. You will be with them again. Hold on. You will get them back. Ethics matters. It really matters. What you do in this world, especially if you are wearing the name of Jesus, what you do matters, is good. There is real purpose. There is real intention. There is real light being shown or shined, depending upon where you come from. Uh, There's real light being shined forth when you live like Christ for Christ's sake. You let your light so shine that they see your good works and they glorify your Father who is in heaven. Sermon on the Mount. It is, if Christ is raised from the dead, and he is raised from the dead, then it is true, it is real, it is loaded with meaning, it is loaded with purpose, and you will do well to bow the knee to Jesus. Have you? Have you bowed the knee to Jesus? Have you received him as your king? Have you received the free gift of having your sins forgiven? Have you received the free gift of the assurance of the knowledge of knowing that you may come on the, the bad end of some deal here on earth, justice may be gone awry, maybe uh, somebody does you wrong. It's okay, it's okay. We don't close the books at the end of this month, okay? Jesus has been raised from the dead. Everything will be set right. Everything will be made up to us. If you think that there's been any injustice, this momentary light afflictions, and people, Paul knew and I know, using that phrase, momentary light afflictions, to describe some of the pains that we're going through, that can only mean one thing. The, the glories that are on the other side of that are huge. These momentary light afflictions cannot be compared to what God has in store for us. Amen? Amen. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you have, but you know somebody that hasn't received, take this message. They need it. Take this message. It's important. If you don't know somebody, then think about who needs you to help them. Like I know, for instance, Jesse is a missionary. Are there missionaries that you can help out in some way? Financially is one way. It's not the only way. Pray for these people. Those are at the the cutting edge. Those are at the sharp end of the plow. Pray for these people. Get behind folks that are doing the work of the kingdom because it matters. It absolutely matters. Christ has been raised from the dead. Victory. Victory. Let's live not like we're the defeated. Not like we don't know for sure. Oh, I don't know. It's tenuous. Ah, it's touch and go. Let's live like victory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you for this text that helps us to see the victory. Thank you, my God, that we have given to us your word, that it helps us to see Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, my God, for what it takes, uh, this this reality, the, the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, fellow believers that can help us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our toil is not in vain. Oh, God, thank you for giving to us purpose in our lives. Thank you for giving us meaning in our lives. Thank you for giving us love, real love. It's not just a biological system. Thank you, God, that this is real, that we really have love. We really have loyalty. We really have grace. We really have peace. We really have cause for all of this. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in the name of Jesus, our Savior and King. Amen.